good afternoon. It is three o'clock and we decided to start on time. We have a lot of ground to cover, so may I ask you to take your seats and we get started. Uh, I am Marcus Kummer. I have been uh, the uh, co-facilitator for this session with, together with my colleague uh, Segun, who is just still walking around. Uh, and let me uh, just briefly, briefly introduce this year's Best Practice Forum on Cybersecurity. Some of you have been part of it, have been on all the calls. We had calls right from the start of the year. This Best Practice Forum is a kind of follow-up event of two previous Best Practice Forums, one on, on unsolicited communication and the other one on C-certs. And last year we had decided it was uh, not necessary to continue with the previous two, but we merged in a way and decided to have one on cyber security. And right from the beginning, this was conceived as a multi-year project. So we have currently, is a document is up on the IGF website. It's still open for comment. Uh, and Martin will go more into the substance of the document, but I would just signal it and encourage you to look at it if you have not already done so, invite you to comment. After the, this session, then uh, Wim from the IGF Secretariat will finalize the document, taking into account also this session and yesterday's main session on cybersecurity, so it will reflect all the discussions here. And if you have any high-level comments on the document uh, already now, feel free to make them. But obviously, we don't want to go into wordsmithing of the document, but I really mean high-level. You didn't like this bit, or you like this bit, or this direction is the right direction to go, or the wrong direction to go in that sense. And with that, I would like to pass on the floor to Martin von Hornbeck, who was our lead expert and who did all the heavy lifting. Please, Martin, over to you. Thank you very much, Markus, and thank you all for coming. We really appreciate you being here. I know many of you have also contributed throughout the year, and uh, this has been a very productive year, and, and I hope to showcase some of that as well today. Now, we have a small agenda that's on the next slide. Um, you may be surprised that we have slides. The goal is just to help guide the discussion. It's not that we are completely stuck to one schedule. If there's a discussion that needs to happen, we'll make time for that. But the main goal today is to briefly introduce a few experts on the areas that we worked on this year, um, many of them contributors to this year's uh, Best Practices Forum, to walk through the document um, at a very high level and tell you a bit what is in there, explain the process that we followed, uh, showcase some of the areas that we've been working on identifying uh, policy options. And then we'll go into a deep dive with the experts in the room on two specific policy areas. And I really hope we get quite a bit of discussion from uh, everyone in the room because you're all experts uh, coming from different vantage points with different ideas. And I think we can really enrich the document with the discussion we have here today. We'll also introduce two high-level areas that were contributed as ideas to continue to work into next year's if the Best Practices Forum is renewed. And then at the end, we'll also dedicate some additional time for questions. Now, let me first go into introducing the panelists. Um, I'll keep it very, very short. They will all tell you probably a little bit more about their background and where they come from. But first of all, we have uh, Deborah Brown from the Association uh, for Progressive Communications. We have Matthew Shears, uh, who is with GP Digital, Benedict Aris from Shadow Server, Alexander Klimburg from the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace, Kaya Sieglic from Microsoft, and I apologize if I mispronounced your name there. Excellent. And uh, Christine Hoopers from CERT BR, which is uh, the Brazilian CERT team. Now, what did we do this year? Initially, at the beginning of the year, we determined that we wanted this year to really focus on development. And the best way to tie into development was by looking at work that had previously been done in the Internet Governance Forum, uh, being the CENB, Connecting and Enabling the Next Billion Projects. There had been two phases of that work at that point in time. One of them focused on identifying very specific policy options that could help various stakeholders understand what policy decisions were positive or negative in actually growing the internet and getting the next billion people online, or next billions rather. 
And finally, they also did work on understanding how those policy options and the growth of the internet can help support development or achieving of the sustainable development goals. The way that we approach that work is by having a few volunteers in the group do a detailed risk analysis of uh, CNB phase one and phase two. And I particularly would like to thank Andrew Cormack for that, who unfortunately couldn't be here, but he was one of the experts that did a lot of that analysis and published that work back to the community as part of this PPF. We then did a focused call for contributions. Uh, we did two different ones, actually. One focused on uh, organizations that participate in the IGF and outside of that community. The second one focused on the NRIs, the national and regional IGFs, because we particularly wanted to get in expertise from these more regional communities. And we did a total of eight virtual and one in-person meeting. Uh, the in-person meeting took place at the Global Conference on Cyberspace just a few weeks ago. Moving on to the next slide, we um, also had a set of detailed email conversations, and I just wanted to highlight the richness of those conversations by showing some of the topics that we worked on. Um, we looked a bit at industry responsibilities and what duty of care means in that sense. Uh, we had a discussion around um, authorization of organizations to hack back. We identified forums that already worked on established uh, areas of work, such as Internet of Things, had a very rich discussion on cyber norms and confidence building measures. Uh, we looked at internet shutdowns, how to define cybersecurity, and how to better engage private sector and government, which has been a challenge historically for this best practices forum. The questionnaire that we sent out asked a few very concrete questions. The first one was, how, do, how does good cybersecurity actually contribute to the growth of and trust in ICT technologies, and how does it help support sustainable development goals? We also asked about the other side of that coin. If we don't succeed at building good cybersecurity, how does that hinder all of those same goals? We also looked at the assessment that was done by Andrew and a few other volunteers to assess the CENB phase two and phase one policy recommendations. And we asked everyone who submitted to identify very specific policy options that help address, uh, and in particular within this multi-stakeholder environment, those cybersecurity challenges. And we also flagged that developments don't really happen in a highly coordinated way. Um, Managing internet governance is really managing complexity because there are many stakeholders involved. They all do individual things and they interact in unexpected and very creative ways. So as a result, we were curious where submitters saw responsibilities for each of those communities in helping ensure that cybersecurity doesn't hinder the future development of the internet. Because if the great work that we do in security prevents new features, new technologies from actually helping people, we're doing something counterproductive. So we wanted to flag or identify where that may be the case. And then finally, uh, based on a suggestion by one of the BPF members who's also here, Wouten Altis, we asked what everyone felt was the most critical cybersecurity issue that could be addressed within the context of the IGF or where the IGF multi-stakeholder community could make a lot of progress. And that led to some interesting discussion throughout the year. Now we received a wide set of formal contributions, uh, in total actually 27, which is uh, almost, I believe, a third more than last year. So we definitely saw significantly more interest than the previous years. These slides have a, a small overview of some of the submissions that we got. One of the things that we did identify is that the amount of submissions from private sector and government were lower than expected or lower than uh, other communities such as civil society and the technical community. And that's something that we spent quite a bit of time discussing and working to identify how we can address this in future years. Then moving on, I would like to ask uh, Olusigon Olukbile, who is uh, one of the chairs of this BPF, uh, to share a little bit with us what was learned yesterday from the main session on cybersecurity, which copied many of the same topics. And I wanted to make sure that as we go into our discussion, we have some of that information here, and it can help us drive forward uh, some of the discussions. So, Shigun, over to you. Well, uh, thank you, Martins. We've been having back-to-back -back meetings since the last uh, main session on cybersecurity, and even the report is uh, still being processed. But what I'm just going to do now is just to give a brief, uh, a kind of a short, um, um, uh, the, 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 the 
information and uh, what I have here is so short, but uh, let me see how it will add value to what we are doing here. Basically, the main section on cybersecurity uh, is entitled Empowering Global Cooperation on Cybersecurity for Sustainable Development. And the rationale behind it is such that uh, we are looking at the process where there can be a continuation of uh, dialogue on where the cyberspace should be, you know, uh, designated as a, a space for development uh, rather than as a space for war. And uh, we're also looking at the intersection between the cyberspace and development and peace. And uh, somehow, most of our speakers came from various background, uh, uh, private sector, civil society, and uh, intergovernmental. And I have some of uh, the representative of this organization here. And um, basically, we, we, most of the speakers recognize the fact that the threats are increasing and that uh, we are ever, you know, um, getting exposed more to the issues of threat worldwide. And um, the issue was further discussed, most especially from the, uh, the government group of expert report. And uh, it was emphasized in that meeting that even though if they were unable to have um, um, a kind of consensus based on the mandate given to them by UN, that uh, uh, the, the IGF should still be a, you know, a place where such a continuation can, can um, um, where such dialogue can continue, such that uh, the modern stakeholder can provide interventions on how uh, the issues of, of cyberspace being deployed for, uh, for, for the purpose of peace and development. Then we also look at the, uh, there are various recommendations and norms that were discussed yesterday, especially from Microsoft and uh, from the chair of the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. Then uh, cybersecurity uh, was discussed fully in depth and uh, one of the key issues that we also looked at is the perspective of uh, human security, how the community can enable and protect human rights, or how the issues of human rights can be balanced from the context of the cybersecurity. But one particular threat, there is one considerable threat in cybersecurity that needs urgent attention. That is the huge gap in capacity because most of the speakers seem to have an agreement that there is a big gap in the areas of capacity to protect uh, us from such threats. And, uh, and the need for us to know, as, uh, you know, to know whether as a legislator or whatever stakeholders group that you belong to, where to invest in critical resources. Then we have a submission from various uh, groups such as SAT Martins and uh, international cybersecurity strategies to are discussed in various um, contexts. And uh, overall, uh, we, we also place emphasis on the fact that there's a need to increase cyber hygiene across the space. Though there are several proposals from new instruments such uh, as uh, the digital uh, convention being proposed by the Microsoft, uh, there was little interest from the floor and panelists who largely prefer to look at how existing law applies and how better implementation of the existing law can help to address some of what we are talking about. But however, the proposal from the Microsoft actually attracted um, uh, a larger interest of the stakeholders in this section. And the Microsoft proposal is looking at how uh, the private sector can provide intervention and how government can protect private sector from the issues of cyber threat and cyber attack. Uh, then uh, finally, we had the pleasure to hear of various uh, specific programs from other countries and other organizations and what they are doing to overcome cyber threats. We had a presentation from Nigeria, and they showcased a kind of um, a case study where multi-stakeholders model was used to uh, drive the, the, the process of cyber security strategy development. So what I can say is that uh, what we are doing here is a continuation of how we can uh, 
look at cyber security from the context of development rather than from the context of uh, military issues. Then the issues of attributions too, we looked at it in depth, and I think there are a lot of contention issues in that area. But uh, for now, I think that is the little I have here, but the detail of the uh, report will soon be made available. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shagun. Uh, typically, this session feeds into the main session. This year, the schedule is a little bit the other way around, but I think that's actually good for the benefit of the document because a lot of this information can now also be reviewed and then see if it fits into the work that we've been doing throughout the year. Uh, moving to the next slide. So this year, as I mentioned earlier, our goal has been to identify policy options that can in a way serve maybe not, even, not as recommendations, but as inspiration to organizations that are trying to identify what the right thing is to do to create a good balanced cybersecurity environment that can help bring the next billions of people online safely and also um, enable us to use technology to achieve the sustainable development goals. Now, this session would be significantly too short if we were to walk through every policy proposal, because if you look at the current draft document, um, it is about seven pages of, uh, of policy suggestions. Um, and a great degree of thanks goes out to our consultant, Wim de Gazelle, who has been uh, putting together that information based on the discussions that we have had in the group. However, I did want to highlight uh, each of the policy areas that were identified as worthy of investigation throughout the year. We looked at securing the reliability of and access to internet services to make sure that people actually can get online in a reliable and secure way. Mobile internet came up, in particular driven by developments in the developing world, where the mobile internet is one of the most important pieces in bringing people on, online uh, due to the lack of other infrastructure. A very important uh, subject was also how we can actually protect technologies from abuse or potential abuse by authorities. There was confidentiality and availability of sensitive information, which is a very typical information security question that came up quite a bit in the discussion. We looked at abuse and gender-based violence, and there were some interesting uh, identifications there of how this actually affects people in different economies and different countries in, in quite different ways. So that's interesting to read in, in the document. We looked at shared critical services. Uh, there's quite a bit that makes up uh, the core of how the internet works and how that needs to be protected. ICS technologies was brought up in particular in, uh, with regards to bringing online technologies that help uh, provision water and electricity. So we're talking about industrial control systems here. Um, one interesting one was how information is sometimes collected and then later reused for different purposes than the original collection and what can be done to limit that level of exploitation of information that may not be um, initially expected. Deployment of secure development processes was an area of great discussion and, and debate. And then finally, how to prevent unauthorized access to devices. Interestingly enough, there were also a few areas that came up that hadn't originally been anticipated in the review of CNB phase one and phase two. And I'm listing those here as well. They're also listed in the document separately. The first one was all about awareness building and capacity development, so education and how do we educate users and where is the boundary between educating a user and actually making the technology secure by default was an interesting area of discussion. There was also cyber resiliency of cities as cities start more and more using Internet of Things style technologies to provide services. Uh, that was an interesting topic where uh, there was some discussion as well uh, which came up in some of these submissions. Lack of diversity in cybersecurity, and in particular the lack of participation by women, was outlined as a, as a significant limitation to allowing us to actually grow cybersecurity as a discipline. Cryptocurrency was brought up. The impact of social media on cybersecurity, in some cases this was actually referred to as fake news, uh, which was considered as, a, as an issue as well. And then finally, whistleblower policies and implementation. As I mentioned earlier, we do not have enough time to go in detail on all of them. I would highly recommend that you review WIMS' uh, excellent document. Um, and it is open for public comment right now. So you can review it, review the individual policy recommendations, and make uh, comments on anything that you would like to see changed. With that, I would like to spend a little bit of time discussing some of these in more detail. And as I mentioned earlier, we brought a few experts with us to this group, in addition to what you bring to the table. So what I'd like to do is for each of these give 
two experts the ability to share a little bit of their thoughts on what some things are that need to be taken into account as policy is developed to meet some of these goals, and then have a wider open discussion for a few minutes on, uh, on things that are important. I would like to ask everyone to keep their contribution limited to about two minutes, so that there's time to get a, a wide variety of views. The first area of, uh, of um, area of policy that, that was brought up as interesting was being uh, certain that we can provide safe and reliable access and tied to that is securing those shared critical services because those two really contribute to the fact that if a user uses the internet it is operated and runs in a reliable way. And with that I'd like to give the word to Christine Hoopers um, who is an expert that's actually contributed in the best practices forum since the very very first one on the computer security incident response teams and, uh, and ask her for her opinion on what some of the challenges are as we come up with policy recommendations in this area. Thank you, Christine, and welcome. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, uh, everyone, for being here. Uh, I think w one of the good things also from this best practice forum to be today is that we get into a lot of discussions and I'll try to cover some of the things that were not covered yet in other sessions and I think that uh, one of the challenges for having safe, reliable, and, and even the security of shared services, because we call them shared services, the core of the internet, but they are actually distributed systems that are managed by different people that depend on uh, different industries that are uh, spread across different countries. So I think one of the major challenges is try to come up with what's the right incentive for all the players to adopt best practices. So if we are talking about IPv6, if we're talking about the NSSEC, we're talking about RPKI, we're talking about not meddling with uh, DNS, and how do we incentive? Because usually the one that implements the best practice is not the one that sees the benefit outright. In, in all of these practices, they are important for preventing route hijacking, preventing uh, DDoS because actually it's just so easy to have DDoS because we have the whole internet at service of the criminals to perpetrate attacks. So I think this is one uh, policy challenge. W what's the incentive? How to incentivize, not necessarily by policy or by market or uh, social responsibility. So it's, it's really, I think we need to have a, a dialogue on that and it's not really easy. Uh, one thing, for example, governments are big buyers they could incentivize by putting really strict rules on uh, we only buy equipments that have best practices, that have security by default. We only hire providers if they implement best practices. So we are all talking about this, but we could also have some incentive that's not really uh, with a policy, but with a push for the market. Another challenge that I think is touched a little bit is uh, secure software because all is software nowadays. And I think academia needs to play a bigger role and is not, in my opinion, into researching more add-on security or more tools. But we should really try to focus more into creating better professionals. So most of the computer science professional engineers and programmers, they leave the university, they don't have a clue how to do secure software. If you leave a civil engineering course, you know how to do a building that will not collapse. But nowadays, the companies are getting a workforce that is clueless on how to make secure software. So we talk a lot about the role of the private sector, but the academia should also think about in inserting secure development and secure software abuse cases. So they need to think that since the very beginning and not create more security training, but create security mindset on the society. And I think this all could then have a better impact on one of the challenges that a lot of people discussed here that is the small and medium enterprises. Because they don't have the budget to have IT uh, guys, to have security systems, and I, if we could have better software and security hygiene, it would solve most of the problems. So I think it's long term, it's nothing like short term, but I think we should think about uh, how we could change uh, how we, we think about the, uh, the industry and the f creation and, and training of professionals. And, and this, it, it really involves, I think, all stakeholders and, and it's a multi-stakeholder problem to think about. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Christine. So what I'm here is very much focused on who and 
when can we incentivize particular organizations to build better cybersecurity? And then the second question is, how do we actually turn it into a mindset rather than just a patch that we try to apply uh, when we have the problem? Thank you, that's, that's very helpful. Um, I'd then like to pass it along to Benedict Addis. Uh, he also has some, uh, some deep experience in the matter in his work with the Shadow Server Foundation. Hello, everyone. Um, my name's Benedict Addis. I'm an ex-law uh, enforcement officer from the UK, and, and then I got better. Um, and and, um, and, and what, I, what I do now is work for an organization called the Shadow Server Foundation, which is a, a not-for-profit set up to uh, do some of the plumbing between CERT organizations, so day-to-day uh, -day in the trenches work of, pass, of scanning the internet for bad stuff and then daily reporting that out to CERTs like Christine's to tell them where the bad stuff is. So I'm really operational, so I'm, I'm, I'm having to change up a few gears to talk to you guys. Um, I think one of the things, one of the themes that's emerged um, for me today has been the, um, the unforeseen consequences of regulation. That sounds rather boring, so let me give you, give you a few examples. Um, one of the things we see um, in my security group at ICANN, the SSAC, um, is where domestic legislation that's intended to improve cybersecurity actually ends up damaging it. So we see a problem that's either pushed away, uh, in law enforcement we call that displacement, um, or where we make a problem actually worse for ourselves. So an example might be where we talk about um, uh, countries seek to uh, localize, geolocalize. For example, Russia has passed some recent legis legislation um, seeking to localize and regulate services uh, uh, so that you have to connect to one another or store content within the physical boundaries of their country. As a result, costs go up to business. As somebody said in the previous session, the internet's a business thing, costs go up. And so what happens? Hosting companies and transit providers and ISPs end up connecting to each other outside of Russia. So the exact intention, which was to localize services and make it harder for other countries to look at traffic, we all acknowledge this happens, actually makes it easier for other countries to look at what should have been domestic Russian traffic. This actually wasn't a problem before. Only 3% of Russian traffic went outside the country, and now it is, because ISPs respond to cost incentives. So this is on the theme of perverse incentives, if you like, and perverse incentives happen a whole bunch of times on the internet. Um, we saw, um, uh, uh, we see a similar problem which many countries have, um, and, and my own country, U the UK, is really to blame in a huge way for this. Um, when we allow courts or, uh, or governments to start blocking domain names, we think, oh, well, it's, it's, uh, it's no harm if we just do it a little bit. Let's just do it a little bit. We, we all know that that, that's, that that never happens. So the UK, sh shamefully in my opinion, and I'm, I'm no longer a government employee, so I'm allowed to criticize my own government, uh, <laughs> not that I didn't before, um, allowed um, the Pirate Bay and other, and other, and other uh, uh, copyright infringement of copyright infringing domain names to be blocked by civil court. As a result, what happens? You educate the population to use VPN services and, uh, 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 and similar. So suddenly we see traffic, uh, we, see, we see traffic obfuscated, uh, on a lower level, we see proxies being used, so people have learnt to get Netflix, for example, to get round these Pirate Bay blocks. They just use a DNS uh, service that's, that's offshore. So suddenly, we are leaking what really governments are starting to realise is really valuable information when aggregated. They're DNS queries. So when you are looking up where a domain name, you know, just the IP address for a domain name, which reveals a huge amount about you and your internet traffic, really, it's very intrusive information, even, even if it doesn't have any content. What, what domain names you're looking up, where you're sending emails to, that information is now being sent to random third parties around the internet. Exactly the consequences we wanted to avoid from a national security perspective. Um, we've also seen uh, uh, um, IP4 run out at a kind of exactly the same time uh, um, that where, where there's been a lot of government attention on this. And rather than sort of, sort of gracefully transition to IP6, nasty standard though it is, it's a heck of a lot better than the alternative, which is, which is that we've, we've just gone wholesale for carry grade NAT. And again, from a law enforcement perspective, we have l almost literally shot ourselves in the foot. We, we, it, it, it's, it, it's a problem that the FBI and the DOJ call going dark. And so again, by, by failing to plan, by putting in stopgap measures, we end, up, we end up actually making lives more difficult for ourselves. And let's not forget, 
I'm speaking from a law enforcement perspective, but I'm a European cop. That means I care about privacy. <laughs> Um, these are not orthogonal, they are the same thing. If we have a bunch of hacked computers, if we have DNS leakage, these, these are things that make it harder for cops to do their job, but also endangers your privacy and our privacy as users. So let, let's, let's, I had a really stupid discussion earlier this morning that said, that said, would you choose privacy or would you choose security? It's not, let's not, let's not have this in this session, please. They're, they're the same, they're aligned with one another. And if cops can, you know, if, if cops are saying they can't do their job, because of, because of encryption and so on and so forth. They need to get better techniques. Um, I, I, I will just plug a, a good news story uh, that we've been working on, which is an excellent example of, uh, uh, including Christine and, and many other people have been, been cooperating with, which is the recent Avalanche Andromeda takedown. Uh, 40 different countries, 50 different national registries participated. Nobody blew the case. Everybody kept security. Nobody blabbed to the media and we successfully took down uh, a, a botnet that was, uh, at the time we took it down, had two million victims. That's two million victims protected, thanks to this huge in piece of international cooperation. Um, Internet and Jurisdiction, have, uh, uh, Bertrand de la Chapelle's project, has written a really good write-up uh, for Center, if, you, if, you, uh, if you're minded to read more. But that's uh, props to Microsoft for, uh, uh, and uh, international law enforcement for working on that one, and all the registries. Um, so some themes to think about there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Benedict. That was very interesting. Some, some good ideas there on, on how policy can actually go very wrong. As in when we try to regulate something, it, it might lead to people making decisions that are less secure. With that, I'd like to make a little bit of time for questions, but we'll have a look first if there are any uh, questions from remote attendees. Nothing? Okay, then are there questions or additions, discussion from the group here? Okay, if, yes, go ahead, Wout. Uh, Wout and Atres, thank you, Martin. Um, I would like to go back to where you said it's harder to get governments and industry particip participation. As you know, I did a whole review about that and a session on day zero. I think I have some answers uh, for that you could think about for next year. Um, what was said is that mainly the resources at that side are perhaps a little bit less than elsewhere because they have to focus on many different topics. So what they advised is to try and find out what their top priority is. And once you call that, you will probably find focus, determination, commitment, and also define some sort of an end goal. Because if it remains vague, they will drop out of the process like has uh, yeah, happened a few times in, in, in the past. So my, that would be my idea to, to get more engagement, to, to find their priority and set together some sort of an end goal and a commitment to the process in between. And then perhaps, uh, I've got some other things later, but this is, I think, the first yeah. possible way forward. Thank you very much, Wout. Um, I think we have time for one more. Any comments or additions on safe and reliable access or sh securing critical shared services? Again, the goal of this discussion is to get ideas that we may need to consider for the final document or get concerns that we may need to test against the individual proposals as well that have, uh, have come up. Anyone from the group? If not, in that case, we'll actually move on to the second set of, uh, of uh, policy options or policy areas, rather. And that was quite an interesting one because, um, as I mentioned earlier, we did have really good participation from civil society in our group. And so this was something that came up quite a bit and, and led to lively discussion. And it's really focused on how we can make sure that once data is collected, uh, that that data is actually used for the intended purpose and is in a way transparent to the user what happens with the data. And second, how can we make sure that uh, we protect internet users against potential abuse by authorities using those very same technologies? And with that, I'd like to give the word to uh, Deborah Brown from the Association of Progressive Communications for a first intervention. Thanks very much. I'm going to sort of lean into the mic here. Yeah. Um, so APC is uh, an international NGO and network of organizations, and we work to uh, improve access to the internet to advance uh, human rights, gender equality, and sustainable development. And for us, cybersecurity is a key dimension of that work. Um, and I think I'll, I'll just start off by acknowledging that technology can be a key enabler of the SDGs, and, but in order for that to happen, um, 
in order for technology to advance sustainable development, data, networks, devices, and most importantly, people must be secure. Um, and we, we've observed a trend of large-scale development projects relying on technology in order to implement sustainable development and achieve the SDGs. And we see some risks in some of the world's most vulnerable people um, with this, this approach. Um, just to give a few examples, in India, uh, this year there were several reports of large-scale data breaches um, with the biometric-based identification system called Aadhaar. For example, in May 2017, it was reported that Aadhaar numbers and personal information of as many as 135 million Indians could have been leaked from four government portals due to lack of IT security practices. And there were additional reports throughout the year um, of similar cases. And so in order for people to trust these programs, in order to, for them to give up their data to, to um, be part of programs that can greatly improve their lives and achieve sustainable development, cybersecurity must be improved. Uh, one uh, example I would point to are the UN Global Pulse's privacy and data protection principles for harnessing big, big data for development and humanitarian action. These principles call for reasonable and appropriate technical and organizational safeguards to be put in place, in place to prevent unauthorized breaches of data and for also for risk and harm assessments to be undertaken to um, avoid any data breaches and to take ris risk mitigation uh, steps before any new or su substantially changed project is undertaken. And I'd just like to maybe add one final point, which is that consent is very critical. People who face discrimination on the basis of gender, race, sexual orientation, and gender identity, age, or any other um, characteristic often are part of these programs and have their data collected for the provision of goods and services or to inform public policy in order to achieve the SDGs. In some cases, full, meaningful, and prior consent isn't there. In other cases, data may be collected for one purpose and then used for another. And if the data is insecure, then these vulnerable and at-risk groups can be the target of violence or discrimination or harassment. So I think um, often when there's the best of intentions to use technology to achieve the SDGs and sustainable development, there's some risks that come, come in hand with that. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah. And I have to tell you, I was very excited when I saw the uh, APC submission this year because I was actually unaware of a lot of the principles that you outlined there. And I think uh, a lot of people from other stakeholder communities, like I'm from the technical community, aren't aware of a lot of these tools that they can actively use. So I think that was very valuable. Thank you. I'd also like to pass the word on this one to Matthew Shears with uh, G GP Digital. Thanks, Martin. <clears throat> Um, what's really interesting about these uh, policy areas that you listed is that so many of them are interlinked and uh, in a way indivisible. Um, and um, I think that points to some of the challenges with addressing um, this one in particular. Um, so let me just say a couple of things and, and point to, Deborah's covered off on the human rights thing. Let me just point up a, a, a number of, and the implications of some security considerations which are actually critical to um, data theft and will become only increasingly um, critical. I think we, 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 it's obvious, it's stating the obvious that we face an increasingly data rich and connected future and that means that we're going to have to work, work ever harder to prevent that from becoming an increasingly data insecure future. Um, we look at these concerns have to be addressed, otherwise we're pretty much at risk, I think much to, in the direction that Deborah was going, that we're stepping into a privacy-less future in which the capabilities of technologies will, um, for extract, extracting and analyzing data will far outpace the appropriate societal or policy responses and our ability to exercise reasonable levels of control. Um, one of the biggest challenges we'll face, and I think it's um, a pretty obvious one, is, is ensuring the appropriate level of security in a range of devices that we are going to become more and more familiar with, which are those devices that are um, um, direct, uh, in for sale, at points of sale that will be accessible to consumers. So we're talking about consumer market, small homes, small business market, where the market pressures um, 
particularly in terms of device cost, will determine levels of security that are embedded in them. And that poses a significant challenge, not only for manufacturers, but also for the users in terms of understanding what those levels of security are, how they might be upgraded, whether they're upgradable or not. And this comes directly back to the issue of theft, because the only way that you can actually prevent that kind of theft and possible repurposing of data is to be far more aware of your responsibility in terms of cyber hygiene and far more aware of the technological capabilities of the devices that we're connecting to the network. So it's a, a set of challenges that we have to um, become very familiar with. And, and, and the Mirai uh, attack that took down the DIN web service is a very clear example of, the, the, of how much we as consumers, and not just internet policy experts, have to be aware of what we're connecting to the network, not only to protect our own information and data, but also to protect the network itself. So I'll leave it, th leave it there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, a very different perspective, but I think it kind of aligns well with the, the problem itself. And um, avoiding that insecure or data insecure future is exactly one of the goals that we have as part of the work that we're doing here. So thank you very much. Um, are there any comments or suggestions or, or things that you haven't heard yet in, in the audience that you think are important that we take along in this paper and in this work? Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Siva Subramaniam. I'm from the Internet Society India Chennai chapter. We had a roundtable discussion on the broader aspects of uh, cyber security, which is not uh, quite uh, any different from um, the broader security uh, area. And um, one of the things that we identified is that the application environment um, promoted by uh, operating systems like Android that needs a bit of uh, cleanup and that needs an, a bit of attention from um, uh, Apple, from uh, Google, and from other uh, ecosystems. And so in the initial stages, uh, they were giving out uh, permission, they, they were allowing uh, applications to have asked for any permission in, in order to foster a, a application environment. And now that it's fostered and there are thousands and uh, thousands of applications, it is time for the companies to move on to the next next phase of ensuring that uh, these applications are cleaned up. So that's one of the very important aspects. And then another core aspect is a uh, much broader aspect is that uh, we've been responding to security threats, uh, which were quite real. And some of the measures uh, taken by law and order agencies and governments are quite warranted. But then we ended up uh, altering the way we live our lives. And uh, if we look at uh, how we live our lives uh, today and how we lived our lives 25 years ago, there is a drastic difference. And uh, is, the, is there any way by which uh, we could have uh, more uh, conducive policies that uh, does not take away our freedom and does not alter the way we all live our lives? That's a much, much broader question that needs to be examined by governments and sec security agencies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Definitely two very important areas. Like policy confusion uh, didn't come up specifically in the discussion this year, but I think it's, it's definitely a challenge in a sense as, as more and more of these policies come to be and there's a, a certain growth of them, how do we make sure that they don't lead to an environment where we lose a lot of control as, as users? So definitely a good point that we can, we can take forward. Uh, the first one also very relevant that we, we had some discussion in the group about um, software development life cycle and how to make sure that, that we incentivize and, and promote the idea that software needs to be developed to be um, or in a secure way. Um, I kind of want to check into my left and, and look at Kaya. I know that she cannot um, represent the, the ecosystem that you just mentioned, but I'm wondering if you have anything that you'd like to add on that because it was a little part of uh, of previous contributions actually in previous years by Microsoft. Yeah, no, and I, I think I would generally, you know, Microsoft generally strongly feels and supports that um, there is a need for both your point earlier, I think, increase the understanding of IT professionals overall um, as they come out of university to sort of ensure that at university, but even earlier, there is a specific cybersecurity aspect to that. Um, I think I know we in our own internal processes have lots have basically adopted an approach where it's 
we hire people and then we train them on security. <laughs> um, and um, I know that's not necessarily scale scalable. And I think the, the important thing there is also to think about, you know, there is now, I think, uh, almost a proliferation and over the last two years of specific cybersecurity degrees. And that's all good and great, but you actually need it across the IT ecosystem. Um, in ter and similarly, in terms of um, sort of secure by design, software development lifecycle approaches, um, we have tried and put out um, sort of materials actually into and in, into international standards to sort of for for people to be able to access and learn what we learned when we had to go through this actually quite steep learning uh, scope over the last sort of 15 years. Um, but I think um, it's and and this is and I think we're increasingly doing things in an area where um, we are moving into IoT and um, also artificial intelligence engineering to, to, to an extent where a lot of the, in particular in IoT, a lot of the sort of devices uh, that are put into the market, and I, I would encourage you not to just think about the consumer devices, but also devices that are being introduced and integrated into critical infrastructure, into enterprises, are sort of being, still being done so without almost security as an afterthought, if at all. Um, so understanding what can be done there where this dramatic, um, with that dramatic expansion of the threat landscape and, you know, whether it's just training or whether it is um, a, a, you know, a collective effort to find a way to, it, to engineer security in the network traffic in some way, um, it's something to think about. Did Thank I you very much. Uh, yes, the gentleman at the back. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Jim Sinulufuye, a chair of AFICTA. Well, there is one word I've not uh, heard much about with respect to securing the infrastructure and uh, enhancing cyber security, and that's regulation. Uh, Matthew Chase talked about uh, the DNA attack, which has been massive, and uh, the last speaker also talked about IoT, artificial intelligence. What, what does it take about regulation? It's a good question. Is there anyone on the panel who would like to, to tackle this and maybe share some of your thoughts on it? Sorry? Oh, if you would like to, Benedict, go ahead. No. Go ahead. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, we're not in a regulation-free zone. We're, we're in, in a zone of overlap of regulation. So um, the Dyn attack, uh, um, that you refer to. This is also the same uh, botnet of insecure Internet of Things devices, mostly home TV recorders and security camera systems that had default passwords set, cheap, nasty devices that are connected to fast broadband connections. There was plenty of regulation around these. There's plenty of regulation around the network. There's no enforcement. <laughs> That's the problem, I would argue. So regulators, are, regulators produce guidance for these systems. They're sold often from China into many different countries. Those countries have varying levels of cybersecurity standards, but also consumer protection standards, civil legislation, all of which could be used by both law enforcement or more likely by consumer protection agencies to hold these, co these companies responsible. Instead, what happened? Some person, in fact, I was involved in his arrest, Daniel, Daniel Kay, gathered all these machines together, trivial, really trivial attack. So stupid, really, and this is what's scary. And fired them both at Dyn, took out a bunch of internet infrastructure, but also at the country of Liberia just before its elections. So these, this same network of hacked devices was directly used to influence an election because we failed collectively. So when you talk, talk about regulation, it's not the problem. I, I, in, my, in my opinion, it's, it's about actually understanding in each country that we all have responsibility for not buying crap devices, excuse my language, and, not, and then actually if we do have crap devices, excuse my language again, in the country, then we, that we, we remove them. And, and as a law enforcement person, I hate to say this, but I just read the manifesto of a person uh, called, uh, what was his name, Kavor, Dr. Kaborkian. Did you see this one? Anybody read this? So, there was, so this, over the last 18 months, that there's been a, a concerted attempt by, an by a, 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 a hack hacker, if you like, 
who took over IoT devices that were vulnerable and destroyed them using software, about, I think, about 10 to 20 million devices. Because this hacker, who believed they were doing the right thing, whether you agree or not, said that by destroying consumers' devices and getting them to say, oh, it's broken, and take it back to the shop for a refund, was the only meaningful way to highlight these bugs, to highlight these terrible flaws with these devices, and actually create an economic incentive for companies and manufacturers to do something about it. And guess what? Two manufacturers did. So it, it seems that vigilantism actually is the only thing standing behind, between us and com complete chaos at this point. Now, that's not necessarily the lesson I want you to go away with. <laughs> But that's, that's how bad things are about. Sorry. May, may I just a quick follow up? Maybe one of the outcomes would be to encourage regulators to be, to be responsive to what they need to do. Yeah. Thank you very much for that comment and thanks for the discussion. I think we have one more uh, comment before we go into the next section. Go ahead, Bob. Well, th thank you for mentioning this, Benedict, because it's, it's exactly what the, the, the duties of care document of the Dutch Cyber Security Council published this year proves, is that there are so many, so many regulations already out there, or, or consumer protection agencies regulations out there that are simply not used on, on the products that we buy. That's one, one comment. The other one, I want to re re point out that in the anti-spam uh, best practice forum of two years ago, there was something about a book called Future Crimes by Mark Goodman from the Singularity University, I think in San Francisco or Los Angeles. And he pointed out as a potential solution to the threats from all these bugs in software. And he, he made a, a comparison to malaria fighting in the world, that there were hundreds of thousands of people putting data in on malaria around the world, and that ha actually helped scientists on the way to cures which is around the corner, actually, at this point in time, I believe. If we were to do something like that on software by, by all these people who are out there find, trying to find bugs in software and collect that at a, at a single point, uh, that this is Mark's idea and not mine, but it's in the BPF outcome as a recommendation. If that is something that could be organized by, or by companies like Microsoft, together perhaps with governments, and set up some sort of a neutral entity in which they come together, then we may speed up all the bugs in the software 10, 100, 100 a thousand times faster than happens at this point in time. And I think that may be a good idea to explore in the next year, because we left it somewhere in the mix of the two once, but because of the discussion, I just thought of it and wanted to bring it back to the table. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rod. And I think Christine actually wanted to add something as well earlier. So, and I'm even like you touched a point that I touched the other day in another panel, uh, the panel about CSERT. So um, I think it, Google is already doing something like that with this uh, open source software uh, fuzzing network. So they have now continuous testing of the major open source software. And they even presented that if at the time the heart bleed was discovered, they had that system in place, it would take 10 minutes to find it. So there are already some initiatives. In the case of Google, they're focusing on the open source software that they use, so of course. But then you have another perverse incentive, that is uh, it, we needed to have not a place for people to report, but really people looking for bugs. And because we have a market where zero days are too expensive and is a market driven by government policy, so it's the kind of perverse effects of policy. I think part of the bad problem we have today is really this market for zero days. But one of the things I wanted to comment early on the policy and on the Android ecosystem is a little bit, I'm going to touch it back later in the session, but I think uh, one of the key problems is not only that we don't have professionals well trained, the university is putting professionals that the companies have to retrain. So only the major companies can do that. So, and then at the other side, we have businesses that are not software businesses, or were not until now, that now are just software shops. And they have the early 90s behavior of software companies, and not the 21st century behavior. So, and this is happening in IoT, and this is also happening, and it's very worried, in the OEM carrier model for cell phones. So part of the problem that we have today with the market of cell phones is that the OEMs, the, the people that do the the mobile phones, they still think in that very old 
telecom mindset that they have this, I make it, and then I make something specialized for the carrier, and nobody's going to touch that anymore. So they need to realize that they are not just OEM for cell phones. They are software companies. And if they are using an open source software, they need to give it the option for that software to be updated. So it's really it, so many uh, stakeholders that are making bad decisions and that are just piling up into all this. So I think it's, it's a very complex problem to deal in the future. So this alone will be a policy challenge for years to come. Thank you very much, Christine. Moving on to the next slide, I think we're actually going to jump into a, a, a new topic. So regarding the poll, oh, I see one more question at the back. I think we have time for one more. So go ahead. Thank you. I want to come back to the, I'm uh, Jens Kessner with the Swiss Telecoms Regulator. I want to come back to the claim that IoT devices were already covered by consumer protection law. That is not the case in Switzerland. And I mean, Consumer protection law does not keep them from being part of, bot of the botnet. And I'm not even sure that introducing such consumer law would change anything about the motivation of the device creators. So I don't think that's uh, the road to follow. Okay. Thank you for adding that. Um, I'm going to jump into the next section really briefly, and I just want to thank you all for adding discussion here to what we have in the document. What we'll do is we'll take some of these comments and integrate them in the document moving forward. And if there are issues that aren't exactly, we're not exactly able to close on here, we may pick them up on our mailing list. So I highly recommend that you join it if you have the ability to contribute a little bit of time at, uh, at finding good solutions for each of these problems. Now, at the end of the year, we started thinking through what areas were that we could work on in the next few years if the best practices forum is renewed. Uh, the way that we did that is we actually asked people what their biggest challenges were in terms of cybersecurity and in particular those challenges that we could address meaningfully in a multi-stakeholder way. So if something is a pure technical issue that can only be addressed by one actor, it probably isn't, um, the IGF probably isn't the best place to discuss it. We came up with a number of different areas, and, and for the meeting, I, I divided those into policy and governance issues, um, technical issues, and then one that particularly stood out, which was fostering a culture of cybersecurity and core values. And that one was interesting because we spent a fair amount of our time talking about education, about what cybersecurity truly meant. Uh, one of the most interesting threads, in, in my view, to read up on in the last year was whether or not an internet shutdown was a cybersecurity issue. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually found myself persuaded by some arguments that were brought up on the list. And I think others at least had some, some things to think about afterwards. But it all led to the fact that there is actually disagreement on what cybersecurity really means. Um, and the definitions that do exist and that have been built aren't universally accepted. Um, I'll walk through the technical issues really quickly. Uh, Internet of Things came up in quite a few submissions. Uh, critical infrastructure, internet resources. Uh, a number of very specific types of attacks that typically manifest themselves in a way that, that affects multiple stakeholders to address them. Cybercrime and ransomware. Cognitive computing and artificial intelligence, in particular the, uh, the possible discriminative uh, results of using those algorithms when it's not really understood how a decision is made mobile network security, abuse, and a lack of education and end user awareness. And finally, policy and governance issues, um, development of internationally agreed upon cyber norms, uh, the lack of frameworks to foster international cooperation and legal principles, state stability and peace in cyberspace, which was definitely a big part of the main session yesterday, so that was quite interesting. Um, increasing awareness of risk management processes. And one particular concern that I thought was very interesting was the fact that people look too much for solutions that solve it all, and so they don't pursue the ones that get us to 80%. So that was raised as a very specific challenge, which I think was quite interesting. And then awareness of criminal justice practices. Now, when we ended up looking at the work that we may do in 2018, um, two specific things really stood out. The first one was culture, values, and norms. So we talked about defining cybersecurity, making sure that stakeholder groups understand it the same way, 
and identifying what values are underneath them. And, uh, and that can be something that then leads to assessing, debating, and improving on cybersecurity norms wherever they're developed. Uh, we have two experts in the area on our panel, and I'd like to give them the word to talk a little bit about what they've seen and what they see as the future. And in particular, I would like to challenge them with the question how um, communities that may not be states can contribute to these initiatives, so civil society and the technical community. And I'd like to give the word first to Alexander Klimburg from the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace. Uh, thank you. So I'm the director of the Global Commission on Stability for Cyberspace Initiative and the head of the Secretariat. So we are a multi-stakeholder endeavor that um, aims to develop norms and policy initiatives to help advance uh, international peace and security issues in cyberspace. So this BPF document is uh, pretty exciting for us because it marks the norms of responsible behavior as one of the key areas for future uh, stakeholder conversation. And uh, the quote you have in it, it's necessary to, in, in order to establish a set of principles and values understood by each stakeholder group. And that is pretty much exactly the language we have been using within the UN group of government experts and other governmental experts and other organizations that have been dedicated to the so-called international peace and security discussion and cybersecurity. So I think it's important to, to advance that norms are non-legally binding voluntary agreements that can be made by any stakeholder group. So they don't only apply to states, not only states make them. ISOC, for instance, has created uh, a norm called manners for, for routing, and there are many other similar forms of explicit and implicit norms that are currently being exercised. So they're not laws, but they're agreements on principles, and they always have, they're always a somewhat a matter of interpretation. And they provide soft incentives and soft disincentives for adherence. So this is a continuation, more or less, of Christine Hopper's question, how do we incentivize good behavior, like adopting DNSSEC or BCP38 source address validation, or a lot of these technical issues that come up where we sometimes think in terms of regulation or we sometimes think in terms of contract design. Another solution are norms. So norms, as I said, are a highly, highly welcome conversation, uh, addition to the conversation here. So norms have been used uh, in the UNGG context since 2013 and 2015. In 2013, the UNGG report effectively endorsed regional organizations to help develop their own norms and confidence building measures. And in 2015, they even put forward some concrete norms of their own. And those norms were, for instance, thou shall not interfere with critical infrastructure, or thou shall not attack certs, or thou shall assist another state in mitigating a serious cyber incident. Of course, all these norms are only applicable in peacetime. In wartime, of course, different laws apply. So norms uh, were developed for states in this context, and that was part of the problem. So the UNGGE realized that it needed to open up a little bit and be accessible to a wider group of stakeholders. And that was also part of their 2015 report, which I will spare reading to you in full. It is a bit dry. But one of the two mandates of the Global Commission on Stability for Cyberspace is the UNGGE recognition that they had to expand stakeholder participation. And in particular, it was necessary to be able to inform the norm development process that occurs within the UN First Committee, International Peace and Security Community. So we believe that one of these norms, for instance, is the one that we've just recently introduced, which is the call to protect the public core of the internet. And this is what we find so particularly exciting, is that, that this call to protect the public core of the internet is potentially connectable to something that you've been discussing here today, which is a principle and a further form of incorporating a common belief, uh, particularly a do-no-harm principle. So for instance, I want to quickly read out what that norm is. It's extremely short, which is usually a good sign. And that reads, without prejudice to the rights and obligations, state and non-state actors should not conduct or knowingly allow activity that intentionally or substantially damages the general availability or integrity of the public core of the internet and therefore the stability of cyberspace. So of course, the big question is, what is this public core? formed out of. In this context, we had a nice and involved discussion that's also uh, in our BPF submission about an inner core and an outer core. Now, the inner core is kind of clearly identifiable as the so-called naming and forwarding functions of the internet, DNS, BGP, etc. And that's kind of clear that that really does, um, that, that really is crucial for the, for, the, for the proper functioning of the internet as a whole. The outer core is a bit more fuzzy, and that can include a whole range of different assets, including, for instance, 
cables or internet exchange points or, for instance, even certification systems. So that's not exactly clear what falls into this area, and this is one of the things that we're hoping for feedback from, from both this community and other communities, to find out exactly what assets, what services are included here. But it's also a chance, a chance to think more about a principle-based approach to these issues. So we think that the outer core can be used as a point of departure to talk about a general precautionary principle, both for state and for non-state actors. So for instance, for state actors, it's important that they consider that when they're engaging in lawful activity in peacetime, and that does include espionage under international law, that they don't do something that inadvertently damages the core, for instance, by wide-scale disruption of rooting, for instance. If you want to look at a recent example, just look back three, four weeks ago what happened in a certain AS in Russia, for instance. Um, that's one example, but this also applies to non-state actors. And for non-state actors, it's quite simple. If you are offering a product or service that can be misused to cause wide spell out outage or disruption, then you should commit to an enhanced level of due diligence on your systems to effectively make it, make it at least somewhat plausible that your service or product will not be misused to such a nefarious purpose. And that basically means that you're committing to a do no harm principle, um, effectively taking a higher level of care into consideration on the basis that just might, you just might be essential to the operation of the internet, at least for a short period of time, and therefore have an obligation beyond those of your stakeholders, um, such as your shareholders. So we are hoping that, for instance, something like protecting the public core could actually become something like a, a, a do no harm principle for core service and product developers that could maybe stand next to the end-to-end -end principle, universal access principle, open standard principles, and other many principles that are being developed, do no harm principle, cause, uh, et cetera, and effectively incentivize actors to um, take an extra level of care when their products and services might be of particular importance to the ecosystem as a whole. And sometimes, of course, it's quite helpful to spell these things out in writing. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for that contribution and, and sharing some of the exciting work that your organization is doing. Um, another organization that spent quite a bit of time the last few years actually talking about norms and, and in fact proposing a few has been uh, Microsoft and so we have Kaya here who can uh, tell us a little bit more about what they've done. Um, sure. So um, I think I would first of all like to sort of echo um, Alex I think and also praise the, the work of the commission. I think the work that you've been doing with it's kind of it's great <laughs> and uh, ha having the ability and you are one of the few organizations that are organizations the wrong word but groups that um, sort of actually does bring in this space multi-stakeholders together I think the reason why Microsoft a uh, few years I guess 2012 started talking about uh, international cybersecurity norms um, was largely because this was a debate that was held by governments for governments, a little bit like Alex referred to, um, and we felt that there, there is a need to shine line, light on the process, there's a, there's a need to, uh, for those decision makers to hear voices from the industry and the others, and um, so we sort of started making a fuss and proposing a few things. Um, I think it's great to see uh, the sort of norms inclusion here. I think we see it as a critical, important contribution to international peace and stability in cyberspace. And you, know, you, you probably, I'm, a, I'm sure you have, heard us talk about the Digital Geneva Convention this week, but I think that's more of a long-term process and, and so in the need to come to a set of agreements in the next few years around uh, norms of behavior for, cyber, uh, for cyberspace for states and also non-state actors um, is, is critical. Um, so I think some of the ideas we, we proposed as part of this was to um, you know, take the UNGG for the, two, the sort of the, their 2015 report that put forward 11 norms, as Alex referenced, as a starting point, for example, and sort of look at how these could, you know, have um, in a sort of informed multi-stakeholder discussion on how this could actually be implemented. I think states have looked at it. I feel that there is an obligation in the, in, as part of the resolution that was passed in the UN for them to report back on implementation of those norms. But there's sort of, I think, very, very few countries have actually done anything about it besides sort of commit to it in, 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 in theory, and oftentimes they're written as fairly vague statements. I don't think they are quite as you shall. 
Um, so, um, so, so there's a level of interpretation. I think it'd be important for uh, for us collectively to sort of investigate those. I think the other option, a little bit like Alice was saying, I think is also to try and identify what are other areas where norms would be needed. I think one of the, one of the calls that Microsoft put out uh, was sort of a norm of non-interference in electoral processes. That was sort of one that was um, highlighted sort of in the last year. But there are definitely others. Core, the core of the internet is something that we strongly support. Um, and have, and have, you know, the ability of having a conversation with academics, with the civil society to see what's important and around the world, because also I think it was very, the debate so far has been very focused on a narrow s geographic scope, in all honesty, um, is something we'd like to see. Excellent, thank you, and thank you both for being very practical as well with suggestions on where we can uh, actually contribute. I see a first question here at the front and then we'll go to the remote. Uh, uh, it's actually I'm uh, Siva Subramanian again from Internet Society India Chennai. I just want to react to what she said, which is positive that uh, industry participation and uh, developing norms and industry contribution. But the only predominant uh, non-state actor in the multi multilateral process is the industry. So it has always been uh, when governments talk about a government-only process or a multilateral process, it's in reality it's not just a government-only process, but a government and industry partnership process uh, in many ways and historically it has been the case and so uh, when it's expanded as a multi-stakeholder process then the civil society is brought in and there is a tremendous amount of balance and so I think we should have the shift from consulting just the industry to consulting everyone for a balance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll get to your question in a second. Are there any remote ones at this point in time? No? Okay, then go ahead. Okay, um, so I have a very specific question, actually. And uh, so um, uh, my name is Driart Shawne. I'm a doctor in computer sciences professor from uh, Pristina, Kosovo. Um, so uh, looking at the issues, specifically at the technical issues, that you have um, showed just a couple of moments ago. I'm quite surprised, I would say, to not see specifically the issue of email security. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking at how we're conducting businesses nowadays, everything is done via emails, um, not fully encrypted end to end. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is a particularly sensitive issue and I hope other cybersecurity experts uh, would agree because um, uh, this is what, what what's causing troubles I would say in the in the cyberspace the most and it's um, about the nature of the business that we're doing nowadays uh, which goes completely via emails and it's completely wrong how we are using emails in general. So we are having um, encryption between the email servers, but we're not having end-to-end -end encryption from the user to the end user. So I think this is a particular issue which should be addressed. And um, uh, if not, I, I, would ha I would like to have an, an explanation why you, you don't include it as a technical issue, yeah. this specific cybersecurity issue, which is email security. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for raising it. Uh, the reason why it wasn't included was because it didn't come up as any of the submissions. I'd encourage you to still send in um, more, uh, more detailed feedback if you have it, and then perhaps it's something that we can tackle uh, as, the, as the process continues. But thank you, it's definitely a, an interesting addition. Um, I think Matt, you here wanted to add something on the norms discussion as well. Thanks, Martin. Um, the, the challenge of the norms is that um, is one that Shiva just noted, which is you know many times as they're norms, but they're not necessarily geared towards or developed by a multi-stakeholder process, particularly in cybersecurity. So I just wanted to draw your attention to one set of norms that were developed through a multi-stakeholder process and that deal with cybersecurity and, and human rights, and that's the norms that came out of the Freedom Online Coalition Working Group One 
on an internet free and secure that developed 13 recommendations, and many of them are norms, about how cyber policies should be developed with uh, taking human rights into account. Just to give you a flavor of them, um, the, first, uh, the second one is the development of cybersecurity related laws, policies, and practices should be from their inception human rights respecting by design. So there's a real focus in that. And the interesting thing about these recommendations is that the work that was put into them has been supported by the 30 governments of the Freedom Online Coalition. So this is a part of the of the, the body of work that we can use to leverage to bring about um, an opening up of the cybersecurity space and to bring more multi-stakeholder engagement into that. So I recommend you look at them at freeandsecure.online. Thanks. Thank you for adding that, Matthew. Um, a second area of potential work for the next year that was brought up actually in, the, in our meeting at the GCCS was um, that we could work on the digital security divide. And this is a subdivision of the digital divide where historically it's been about users that were not able to access the internet due to very, uh, various limitations. And as that has been more and more addressed, there is a concern that users that either do not have the funding on, or don't have um, another way of accessing specific security measures may actually be using an internet that's less trustworthy than other users. And I'd actually like to give the word to Matthew as well first to uh, tell us a little bit about what um, ideas he has around that area that could potentially be useful for the BPF. And given that we're running out of time a little bit, I'm going to ask everyone to really limit it to two minutes of the next few speakers. Okay, so um, this is a really interesting challenge that, that came up out of, um, I mean, people are referring to this increasingly, but it came out, out of, up out of some work I was doing with the Internet Society on their Internet Futures report that was released in uh, September. And this is the fear that um, we're working very hard to address the access divide. Um, but when you start to consider the challenges globally and the differing levels of cyber awareness and the differing levels of development and the differing levels of financing for putting in place cyber security systems and processes and frameworks, the, the, it raises the specter of a security divide. So not just a digital divide, but rather, and not just an access divide, but a, but a security divide that in turn could imperil the progress that we're making on, an ac on the access divide. And I think this is not only a, a security divide issue, but it's also an SDG issue. So for example, if you take SDG 2, which is about zero hunger, you can, um, there they're calling for doubling agricultural production, and much of that is going to have to be done through embedding technologies into those production processes. Many control systems, you can imagine that those systems will be incredibly vulnerable without, vulnerable without the appropriate level of security, which could in turn imperil attaining the SDGs. So there's this issue of how, uh, of this issue of the security divide um, has implications across the board. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, someone else that I'd really like to ask for her opinion on this is uh, Christine Hoopers. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I would like to make just uh, two brief points. And, and one point uh, is that a lot of the problems we see in Brazil, Brazil is a developing country. We have so far only half percent of the population that uses the internet. From this, more than half just uses cell phones. So is, is the, the current uh, trend. And one of the things, uh, w w Nick PR, that's the organization that hosts CERT PR, we have, um, we also conduct since 2005 all the national surveys about ICT use in the country. And if you try to cross questions for the households that are how security, how aware they are with security, it really relates with literacy. It's not only digital literacy, it's literacy. It's more than wealth and poor. It's really uh, how well educated they are, uh, if they have education formal, if they don't. And uh, f then coming from our perspective that we produce a lot of end user awareness material that is still important. You can see that even for companies today, really the major thing is phishing, is targeted phishing, is whaling, and you go for the human element. We still need them. So it's really hard to do user awareness when the user does not understand the technology or the risk or the threat. And this goes then to have better technology, but then it goes back to what we discussed before, that we needed to have better software, not so faulty, a better ecosystem for smart smartphones, smartphones that could be updated and not like 10 or 
uh, in Brazil, we still have most of the smartphones that are being sold, they have at least uh, the Android for three years ago. So they are coming to the users without the ability, full of vulnerability. So I think it's really more of an ecosystem, as I said before, OEM carrier, industries realizing they are selling software and thinking about creating a better ecosystem. But I think literacy is, is really a challenge for the, the digital security div uh, divide. And, and I think we should think about that. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. And then finally, Deborah. Thank you. I wanted to um, highlight two types of, um, a breach of, of communities that might face more risks um, in digital security. Uh, the first relates to the point I made earlier that when data breaches of sensitive personal data occur, uh, certain communities are more at risk, such as women and uh, people who face discrimination based on their sexual orientation and gender identity. To give an example from Brazil, from Sao Paulo, there was a database containing the records of 650,000 patients that was made public, including um, patients who underwent abortion procedures. And in Brazil, abortion is illegal even um, for people who might are at risk of carrying Zika. So if, if uh, those identities are made public and these women are then um, revealed to have their identity to have had an abortion, there's a, a much more um, severe consequence. And the second is that uh, women and people who face discrimination based on their sexual orientation are often proactively attacked or um, harassed online. And examples include threats of rape, of death, um, cyber stalking, hacking of email accounts, um, of mobile phones, and doxing. And these have consequences offline as well, especially when someone's address is made public and threats are made against them online. Um, and while there are lots of measures that could be put in place to, to um, prevent such threats, and I'll, I'll wrap up soon, um, the last year's BPF, the Best Practice Forum on Gender and Access, actually showed that one of the threats or one of the barriers to women's meaningful access and use of the internet are these threats online. So sometimes the threats just simply aren't worth being online and being exposed to them. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. So these are two areas that we plan to, uh, to consider working on for the next year if the BPF is renewed. Uh, I see one comment from Wout. Thank you, Mark, because I have to run off to because I have to oh. speak in a session that ends in 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to jump ahead to the rest of the program because three very short comments. As we see, we're already running out of time. What I would advise to do is ask the MAG for more flexibility on best practice for uh, and, and, and the whole program because topics came up this year that need a whole session to discuss and not mm -hmm. just being mentioned. So two or three slots that could be filled in during the year while the process from the MAG is going on as it does. So more flexibility in the program for best practice for uh, and intersessional work in general. Two, if we have a success, let's learn to celebrate it. Let's put it out there because that makes us more attractive to others to, to, to participate in the future. So how do we identify success? How do we disseminate it and then reach out? Three is more commitment from the MAG once they decided this is our topic of the year in a best practice forum, then we need commitment on reach out. So then it's not that we're on our own afterwards, but that needs some help. And the fourth is, let's identify a case that we can work on together and work towards a common goal that is identified up front. And whether that is in IoT or artificial intelligence or like the email security, the gentleman, a very good example. If we identify one very early on in the process, we may be able to get other people on board. And thank you very much for being able to tell it. And, and, and good luck with the report. I will definitely be whim and you finalize it. Thanks. Thank you, Art. There were some comments on the side there. The gentleman next to uh, Serge, I think, was first, and then we'll make Oh. Oh. Um. You might want to speak up and I can okay. re repeat the question <laughs> so, I need or the comment. Ah, okay. um, my name is Serge Rose. I'm also a member of the first board where I'm in charge of training and education. And, and when it comes to kind of cultural values and digital divide, I, I feel there is a lot that these two have in common. When we deliver trainings in the so-called difficult locations, what I often see is not that people there have little knowledge or bad technology, but what I often hear is that when we call the big companies or reach out to so-called developed nations, we don't get an answer. And when I ask 
in the so-called developed nations or the big tech companies, why do, don't you answer? I get the answer back saying, well, they always ask such strange questions. And that for me is a sign that, that we have a cultural gap. We don't seem to understand each other. And I think this is something that, that we really need to address. I mean, we put the fibers there, but we still need to learn each other's language. And I would really like to see this aspect flowing in because it's, it's not about the West dictating those people how they have to do and how, have to run the internet. Uh, it's also not those people telling us you have to do it this way, but we have to find a common way to work on this common infrastructure. Okay, thank you, Serge. And I was just informed that we're actually running out of time. So what we'll do is if you quickly go to the next slide, please. Um, there is an additional session tomorrow at 1.30 uh, where we'll have time to discuss next year's work. So I would recommend if you have suggestions or discussion, please come there and happy to address them. Otherwise, sign up to the mailing list and there you can also bring up anything that you would have liked to bring up and we didn't have time for. We'd be happy to engage in discussion there. With that, I'd like to hand it back to Marcus for a second uh, to just, give a few closing words. Well, I mean, just to say uh, what Martin said, we will have this session tomorrow and maybe also decluster the issue. It's not a binary thing whether we are going to continue as a best practice forum on cybersecurity, but it is about making suggestions to the MAG then for issues, and that may be taken up also uh, somewhere else in the context of the IGF. That may be a main session, whatever, but it is good. It's tremendous work these experts have done over the year and if we can come up with some reasoned suggestions for future work and not just say this is what we want to do as best practice forum on cybersecurity, these are interesting issues, but present the issues in a reasoned manner for consideration to the new MAG in the new year. So, and we can continue the discussion also in substance if there are questions. It's good to have a vibrant discussion and it was an excellent discussion we had, but unfortunately, we have to vacate the room. There will be other people coming in. So sorry to cut down on the questions, but it's always better to leave when you still have appetite and not sat completely bored stiff with everything has been said, but not yet by everyone. So thank you all for participating actively. And our thanks, of course, go to Martin and all the panelists. Thank you.